All right, good evening, everybody. My name is Jonathan Schaefer, and on behalf of myself and everyone at Zion National Park, thank you for making time to join us tonight. I'm glad to be joined by our superintendent, Jeff Bradybaugh, and our chief of facilities management, Dr. Bry Carter. We're looking forward to sharing information with you about the improvements the National Park Service is considering for Zion's South Entrance Area and South Campground. To begin our one hour meeting, Superintendent Brady Ball will take a minute to welcome you, and then you'll hear a presentation from Dr. Carter about the improvements that we're considering. After the presentation, we've set aside about 30 minutes to answer your questions. Please type your questions in the meeting chat, and we'll address them after the presentation. We will not be taking questions audibly, but we will be sharing a recording of the presentation on the National Park Service's Park Environmental and Public Comment website. We'll be sharing the link to that site throughout the presentation. But now to get us kicked off for the evening, it's my pleasure to introduce Zion National Park Superintendent Jeff Brady Baugh. Thank you, Jonathan, and welcome everyone to this virtual presentation. We hope that you'll participate in the public engagement portions of this project as it moves along. We're in the initial stages of this project right now, considering your input, your ideas and suggestions to make this proposed program more usable, help visitors access the park, and at the same time protect park resources. As you may know, Zion has experienced a very dramatic increase in visitation over the last decade, but particularly in the last five or six years. During that process of increased visitation, in fact, we saw more than 5 million visitors um, visit the park last year. We've done a number of things to help visitors access the park safely. And these project components that we're gonna talk about tonight are things that we've considered over a, a number of years in some cases, and in other cases more recently, to deal with some of the visitation, traffic congestion, and safety issues that we experience with this level of visitation. This is our initial outreach to you. And again, we're looking for your input as we move ahead. As I said, this program of projects really involves a number of components that we'll talk about, ranging from rehabilitating the South Campground, which has been considered for well more than a decade, to more recent um, program and project development, looking at, at how visitors circulate in this very confined area around the south entrance that includes a visitor center, two campgrounds, multi-use trail, and our shuttle system. So it's really important that we get this right, and we hope that you'll help us with that. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Bry Carter, who leads our facility management program here at Zion. Bry? Thank you, Superintendent Brady Botts. Uh, my pleasure to be here with everyone this evening. Thank you all for participating in this discussion and this collaborative effort that we, uh, we hope to draw from you some insights um, on our initial concepts as we uh, put together this, this project. Um, please uh, forgive me as I turn off my camera and shift to presentation mode so that uh, we can see that in its entirety. And, you won't be distracted by me. This is a wonderful view of the um, south entrance after it's been recently rehabilitated. You can see the, the new entrance lanes and the, um, the traffic entering the park. 
And uh, I'd like to point out a few things here uh, before we get into the weeds of this presentation. We're, we're kind of constrained as we enter the park by uh, the limitations of the State Route 9 uh, coming through Springdale, Utah. And um, we've done our best in the past couple of years to maximize our ability to provide an entrance, a smooth entrance for visitors into the park. However, um, once you get through the shuttle um, fee stations themselves, there can be some cross traffic flow as visitors attempt to navigate their way to either the visitor center or onward through the park. And um, this can cause some, this can cause some problems in the traffic flow and, and some, it increases risk and safety. Um, visitors must turn immediately right and then go down a road uh, in this manner and cross over a narrow bridge uh, interacting with pedestrians and other modes of transportation. And we'll get into that in uh, a little more detail here later on. The purpose of this proposed uh, south entrance redesign project that we're talking about this evening is really sixfold. Um, it's intended to improve circulation for visitors, uh, to create um, connections, meaning it, for visitors to move throughout and within the, within the park in an, in an intuitive way where there is less of a need for uh, them to find themselves asking for directions. It's also to refurbish our existing buildings and modernize park facilities. They're in, uh, in conditions that need attention as well to address uh, compliance issues with the Architectural Barriers Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act, while also improving visitor safety and protecting, of course, our natural and cultural resources. This presentation is an overview of the proposed improvements, and uh, you can get more detail at your leisure by reviewing this presentation and the notes that are provided therein. Uh, and of course, by asking questions through the appropriate um, uh, manner in, in Pepsi, the Planning Environment and Public Comment uh, website. And Jonathan will uh, talk more about that at the end of this briefing. I'd like to start off by giving you this broad overview. And showing you a few things about the, the presentation itself and how you can move through it. You saw there that I'm, I'm scrolling my mouse down to the next slide. And um, we hope that you enjoy your time in this presentation. Uh, again, to, to read through the details in the, in the textual blocks that, that come and go as you scroll down. You can also click and drag so that you can see the map as you want to. And you can come over here into the lower right section of your of screen and you can zoom in as well. And we'll definitely zoom in and we'll show you some details as we go through the presentation. So this is just an example of how you can navigate uh, through the presentation. In this particular slide, you can also uh, identify by clicking on these individual locations on this particular slide and identify what that is and how it relates to the text on the left side here. So in a broad overview, the proposed elements include uh, the, 
addressing some of the issues and concerns that we have with the pedestrian entrance located here. Let me just take a moment and zoom in on that for you. And bear with us if there's any screen delay, I'll try to be slow and methodical about that so that you have an opportunity to see that. I don't wanna distract you as we're talking. There's the pedestrian entrance element of work. There's the Canyon, uh, the Zion Canyon Visitor Center access road and how to approach it, how we might more efficiently get visitors to the Visitor Center parking lot, for example. There's the shuttle maintenance facility to address the transition of our shuttles from propane to battery electric bus fleet and a long-term solution for employee parking and access to and from the visitor center. So we click and drag here the fourth element. You see that it's the South Campground in general, and we'll talk about the particular elements of the South Campground redesign effort, including the Perus Trail and how it integrates And we'll talk about pedestrian routes and how we propose to address some of those concerns. So let's move over to pedestrian routes and the pedestrian entrance in particular. We'll give it a moment to process. Here is our pedestrian entrance, as you would see it about midway through the bridge from um, privately owned Zion Canyon Village as you walk toward the entrance station. And that, that station is located right here in this area. And that photograph was taken about in the middle of that circle. And you can see in this graphic from this, this top view, some concerns and some issues that uh, are related to the visitor experience. And that's primarily what we're trying to achieve here in what we'll be proposing. <clears throat> you can see that the entrance to the, to the bridge is set back and at the tree line. And prior to that, visitors navigate their way through uh, this constructed area. That's if they can see it from a parking location here along the State Route 9 or in a parking uh, lot, a paid parking lot. So there's an expectation on the part of the park and um, in this case, Zion Canyon Village, that visitors would be able to see where they need to go to enter the park. And so that can cause some problems. One of those problems is traffic needing to move uh, up toward the main entrance to the park that I previously showed you uh, in the form of foot traffic or uh, cyclists, because it's more prominent to see the main south entrance from the State Route 9 than it would be to see the pedestrian entrance over in this area. Here's another uh, image of that entrance and you can see what I mean uh, a little bit better in this view with the bridge access set quite a ways back behind the commercial uh, entities. And uh, it's just, it's really, uh, you know, there's a small sign here, as you can see, uh, it's, it's not a prominent feature in, in this particular area. And so that does make it difficult for uh, people to find their way 
to the actual fee station, which is across this bridge. As you can see, the fee station is not visible at all. And so in our, in our um, thinking on how we can address those challenges and prevent mixed traffic interaction along this section of the, of the highway where cyclists would come up and, for example, get here and realize that they cannot pass through the vehicular traffic lanes and they are sometimes needed to be turned around uh, and therefore interact with traffic and trying to cross over or trying to come back in this manner um, against traffic flow. And of course, pedestrians uh, find their way uh, in this area as well. So these are concerns that we absolutely need to address in order to improve safety for visitors and improve the visitor, improve the visitor experience. Um, so we have here on this graphic, uh, three potential uh, concepts of how we can make that pedestrian entrance a more prominent uh, feature for uh, visitors to see from the highway and to access into the park and to access the park in a manner that doesn't dump them into or right next to a parking lot, but rather uh, the prominent features of the visitor center, the visitor center um, pavilion area, and uh, the, the main comfort station that supports this area as well, easy access to the shuttle uh, stop, the visitor center shuttle stop, which is our main shuttle stop. <clears throat> and it, we would start with, uh, for example, the Zion Canyon Village Transit Center concept, as you see here, and highlighted in this manner in green. And so the general concept for this option is to move the pedestrian bridge up into this area so that we're not having to maintain and man two fee stations and two bridges and make the fee station stand out more still in park boundary within the park boundaries. So it's a, it's a park owned and maintained and operated uh, fee station, but still give the shuttles an opportunity to drop off and pick up passengers to carry them to and from the town shuttle system and its stops. And this lands the visitors right near the comfort station and then onward to the visitor center if they like. Another option is the Zion Canyon Village exit only concept where shuttles and tour buses can come off of State Route 9 and make their way around as well, dropping passengers off and then leaving through this parking lot to go back to the town and pick up more visitors. So that's another option. A third option is a little bit larger than either of those two. And we're calling that right now the in-park transit center concept. And um, this could have a variety of entrance points. The, this particular concept graph that you see shows the entrance point along this, uh, which would be a new roadway and a, a much larger transit area where uh, shuttles could come in and and go out or come in, drop off and go out in this manner. This option also provides uh, for pedestrians or cyclists who may have found their way up the road, but can be directed by signage onto this path and then toward the fee station and then onward to the visitor center and so on. So, Again, I would like to emphasize at this point that what we're reviewing here is a design concept. And so 
none of this is set in stone. We're exploring options, and that's why we're engaging with you this evening so that we can get your input. Let's move on to roadway improvements. As you can see here in this picture, um, as like in any other intersection, there's, there's quite a bit of traffic. This particular intersection um, provides us a couple of unique things about Zion and, and, and left turns, I'll say. There's quite a bit of traffic flow as we see with this truck and travel trailer turning left in this intersection to get to our oversized vehicle parking area and slash RV parking area. There's also shuttle bus traffic needing to enter the intersection and turn left to get out of the park or deeper in the park if these shuttles are heading up the scenic drive. <clears throat> this, this intersection also receives campers going across the intersection and onward to our Watchman campground. So there's a lot of RV traffic, it's a lot of vehicular traffic, and there's probably even more pedestrian traffic. There's a crosswalk here that you cannot see, it's just out of the picture view. There's another crosswalk over in this area that's also just out of the picture view. And those visitors sometimes get confused and can sometimes be lulled into a uh, misperceived sense of security when the intersection is momentarily void of vehicular traffic. And that does sometimes occur. And uh, then visitors find themselves in a precarious situation, an unsafe situation, trying to cross over, for example, or shortcut the intersection itself. So this is an example of multimodal traffic uh, problems that we have. We couldn't find a picture where visitors were doing that because, well, most likely our interpretive staff who man this area have jumped in and uh, averted uh, you know, a potential unsafe situation. There we go. Hopefully you see the graphic that I'm looking at and you see uh, another example of um, multimodal traffic interactions. This, what this graphic doesn't show, and I think we have one later in the brief that we'll show you, is the pedestrian um, traffic element to this. And I believe some of these bicycles here are e-bikes. It, it looks like possibly two of them are e-bikes maybe more. So we get uh, not only cyclists, but we get cyclists on e-bikes that travel at a bit higher rate of speed in combination with pedestrians, in combination with vehicular traffic and shuttle traffic with in, in many areas of the park with double yellow lines. And so in order for those to, those traffic mo modes to be deconflicted or self-organized, if you will, to pass these cyclists, for example, a shuttle will have to come out over a double yellow line and <clears throat> present itself into oncoming traffic. We certainly don't want that. Another part of our briefing that I'd like to show you is this feature. And you can, you don't have to take your cursor. Let me just pause for a moment to make sure that we are spotlighting this. Perhaps you can see my cursor a bit better now. You don't have to bring your cursor down to this point in or, and to click and hold and then slide. You can do it anywhere along 
the vertical line here. And you can in this in this particular slide, you can see that you can slide all the way to the right and you can see the as is and the proposed. And so let me just go over a few of the as is uh, situations here. We noted earlier in our discussion about the pedestrian entrance, the three options that lead to the visitor center area, the shuttle stop area, we talked about what we've been able to do. This particular graphic isn't the new um, south entrance stations that you saw at the beginning of the brief, uh, but we did talk about how we've reconfigured that to improve the flow into the park as best we can. One of the challenges we have right now is when you come into the park, uh, you have to turn right to go to the visitor center and it, it almost immediately begin interacting with uh, pedestrian traffic. There's uh, left turns, left turns as in any other intersection, but it, it can become more congested uh, especially during our weekends and holidays and our high visitation days, which many would quip that uh, every day is a high visitation day in, in Zion National Park. Well, they, they may be right. And that includes shuttles and tour buses and RVs that are oversized uh, that didn't know about the tunnel restrictions and, have, and aren't planning on camping in the park and have to be turned around. And so there are turnaround issues with large trucks and including recreational vehicles. We've addressed that somewhat in our, in our current state of our South entrance, but there are ongoing issues as I previously explained. So let me just pull that. We'll just observe that feature. And what I want you to do is Watch this road over here. This is called Watchman Road. It leads to uh, employee housing and some other areas of the park that um, visitors don't normally travel down here. But as I pull through this, you can see how the road changes in the proposal. And you can also see down here at the bottom how the shuttle stop area proposal changes the landscape. So the road is severed in this area. It comes in, and again, this is shuttle traffic, employee traffic, maintenance vehicles and whatnot, employees heading to housing and shuttles. And you see how we transition. And you also see up here how we transition and um, redefine the Perus Trail near the south campground. And the first thing that might jump out at you is this, this new bridge with the, um, the pedestrian walkway. We'll show you an artist's rendition of that later in the brief. <clears throat> the RV and oversized vehicle parking lot is slightly increased in size but most, uh, most of the change is the way in which the lanes are laid out. And again, this is a design concept. We're still working on how large vehicles will enter this area. There's been some discussion since this graphic was produced that we may bring those RVs in in a manner that drops them off the road rather than has them circling into the center of the park parking lot. You also see down here a new roundabout um, that's part of a system of improved access for the shuttles. And this, this helps the shuttles <clears throat> get to and from the maintenance facility from the shuttle stop area uh, in and out to the park where they need to go. The shuttle stop area itself is only slightly reconfigured in the proposal. This, this area here exists, as does this small 
area under the wording shuttle stop and the uh, the turn coming out exists already and it goes it takes a left and it goes down the the previous road and if you're following my cursor you can see that's the original road alignment so we're taking advantage of not moving this bridge keeping it in place and uh, we'll explain further about the other bridge this you might you might be able to tell in this graphic uh, this little arm here uh, we call it a one-arm bandit it's just a traffic uh, preventer um, for emergency vehicles and or shuttles to get through only so it, it's intended to as a last measure to keep rvs in this parking lot from turning right and, and getting into this traffic flow that they're not supposed to be in. But we still allow them, of course, access into the traffic circle so they can go onward to the visitor center parking lot or the watchman campground or to just exit the park. <clears throat> you see a little bit of the south campground change up here and um, that, uh, just real briefly, the South Campground design is the redesign is um, moving along, and we're we're on the beginning stages of the design, as you see here, for how this roadway would approach this new bridge. So all of these things are still in discussion, and, and we're still gathering information and uh, trying to make the best decisions for how we would lay this out. So. Uh, that first graphic we showed you, the south entrance, this right here currently exists, as, as do several of these parking spaces and this minor attempt at accommodating the need for turning vehicles around right in this area. <clears throat> We're looking at a traffic circle option for moving traffic into the park more smoothly and uh, giving people an opportunity to turn around much more effectively, especially those large vehicles with the, 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 the tractors, with the 53-foot trailers and the large fifth-wheel campers and other oversized vehicles. <clears throat> this is, again, this location is not set in stone, uh, could move more to the west or uh, it could be reconfigured in a way that... Um, minimizes further cross-traffic interaction. We're showing you here that we're looking for options to have the most flow, continuous flow of traffic. There's an option here to come in and head toward the visitor center, but there's also an option here for people who've just passed through the fee stations to stay in this leftmost lane, still enter the traffic circle and still come out to the visitor center and a, a roadway and move on toward the visitor center. So we're trying to take into account uh, as many of the situations that we've, we've observed in the past in the new solution set. So I'll just slide that to the center. We'll move out of that graphic and move on to the shuttle facility. And we've got a few, quite a few users on our end. Must be slowing down the video download. There we go. I talked a moment ago about uh, our propane fleet being transitioned to a battery electric bus fleet. This bus here is just an example. We don't, we don't own this particular bus, but this is an example of one of our uh, inbound um, battery electric buses with a that we call articulated, a 60 foot articulated shuttle bus. And so there's some issues with between differences rather between the propane, the current shuttle bus fleet and their trailers and the battery electric buses and their articulated uh, trailer section as well. So we'll go to a similar graphic where we can see the before and as we transition here, I want to point out that there's no intention of altering anything here in the shuttle bus maintenance facility, except slightly the reuse of the propane tank that 
is currently used to fuel our shuttle buses. We intend to keep that in place if we can. Again, we're, in this, we're at the very beginning stages of design uh, to look into some particulars about our concepts that you see here. So our concept is to perhaps locate a large enough generator to power um, a portion of our battery electric bus maintenance facility to charge those buses and, and the fuel source, the backup fuel source being propane for that generator. Um, continuing on, there's no intention of uh, changing the pedestrian bridge that exists here that leads between the employee parking lot and the shuttle bus maintenance facility. Uh, however, we do need to address some drainage issues that we experienced in a flood last summer. And uh, we start some of our uh, changes to the landscape in this area by elevating uh, this particular section to accommodate a larger culvert so that we don't have drainage issues in the future. And the employee parking lot, um, we did a, a small study here in the park and we've determined that the employee parking lot needs to expand by a certain number of spaces. And uh, with the employee parking lot here, let me just clarify so that everyone understands these parking spaces in this area go away in the proposed change. So they're relocated over here. And that requires an accessible route because we need to accommodate our accessible employees to the visitor center, to and from the visitor center. So it'll include this feature. And then what you see up here is our existing uh, electric bus fleet infrastructure. And we have some existing dispenser locations, but we need to grow this for our, our fleet transition. We'll have another phase of dispenser installation in this area. We'll have a larger uh, infrastructure area and dispenser location as our battery electric bus fleet grows to our, um, our maximum level. <clears throat> this is that roundabout that I showed you earlier. And so as a, in summary, it does increase the footprint of asphalt in this area. Uh, where this proposed asphalt is, uh, would um, would no longer be a flood uh, issue for us. In the previous flood last summer, we had blockage of the culverts here and it, the water overflowed the road here and also into this area. And so uh, this addresses and directs that flow to stay in the, in the channel under the roadway and then onward to the Virgin River. Let's move on to the South Campground. This is a artist rendition of one element of the South Campground that would uh, have at least a dual purpose right now is our concept. And that would be to uh, act as the uh, intake, uh, the receiving for the South Campground patrons, as well as our uh, host our uh, wilderness permitting so that visitors can get their wilderness permitting here, rather than having to interact with and become part of the, the crowd uh, of pedestrians that work their way in in and around the current visitor center location where wilderness permits are um, provided. Uh, many of our patrons who, uh, who need wilderness permits come to the park only to get their wilderness permit and then they leave because the, those, um, those particular hikes and, and opportunities um, are, not, are not all within the, the main South um, Canyon area. 
We'll pause for a moment. There we go. Starting to come up. What you see here is a couple of different campsite types that uh, we have in mind for the South Campground. You can see they range in size from 40 feet long to 20 feet long. Various features all generally have. Uh, a, a picnic table and uh, a fire pit, fire ring area, and then um, a tent space adjoining the camping space or the, the parking space. The, the sites are not intended to be um, improved sites with uh, throughout the campground with, with power and, and full services. There will be some but not all of them. So let's talk about that. Some of the challenges with the South Campground are uh, a limited size uh, in the dump station, which is right here as patrons exit. Uh, highway traffic comes in currently and goes in this manner into the campground and there's not really a fee station. There's a camp host slash small booth in this area that, uh, that take care of those patrons. One of the things about the South campground that's um, a little bit confusing to visitors is the way in which they need to travel to get to and from their campsites. It's kind of a, it's kind of a spaghetti mess right now and <clears throat> there are uh, more significantly there are drainage issues throughout the campground that it's hard to see in this graphic that on this side of the highway over here this is uh, quite steep and you can see some natural drainage flows coming down through this area there are four main culverts along this highway and uh, one of them is currently blocked. And we, uh, during the last flood, we had uh, most of them, I believe actually all four of them became blocked rather quickly. And then the water uh, rushed over the road and then into the campground causing some site damage and some impact to visitors who were in those sites. Uh, just a, kind of a, a muddy, bouldery mess that occurred uh, because drainage in the campground uh, needs attention. Thankfully, no one was hurt in that event in the campground area. There's also a need to address some, uh, <clears throat> some site issues up in this area and to um, expand uh, the the Perus Trail, make it accessible, more accessible. So let's slide that graphic over and see what we're talking about here. Talking about uh, better wayfinding and pathways to and from the amphitheater, a new comfort station within the campground, renovating, uh, Mission 66 Comfort Station, improving that pathway, that Perus Trail path, providing uh, access from the Perus Trail through the campground because there are needs for visitors to get to comfort stations perhaps along their way. Uh, so this provides them access, this does as well. Uh, there's potential in the future exploring an optional additional campground loop. That may be explored, but we're, we're really focused on the existing South Campground in this design concept proposal that we're putting forth. Um, we also intend to uh, 
include if this moves forward a new day use area, um, a small orchard to recognize the history of this area uh, uh, and the orchard use that was that existed. Um, a larger, uh, more functional dump station. Talk about that fee station and wilderness permitting office that would be located here with some parking and accessibility uh, issues addressed to and from that. <clears throat> we're also, now you may think we're really big fans of traffic circles, but there have been many studies that show traffic circles do improve the flow of traffic and they do relieve congestion. So this is where we're starting based on uh, that research and just uh, empirical evidence and the experience that uh, we draw from, from one of our civil engineers here in the park who is also a, a traffic uh, engineer and has worked many years with uh, UDOT. Uh, so this traffic circle, easy for those big RVs to come around and exit to make decisions and, and the flow is obvious it's intentional. Um, it's easy to pass by your campsite and back right into it. Uh, so that, you know, regarding the traffic flow, you can see how much, much more improved it is in this manner. Again, uh, highlighting those pathways. And I, I suppose now is a good time to provide you with information that, um, this, these pathways are intended to be um, intended to be uh, multi-use, so they're drainage ways as well. Uh, let's see. We've hit the highlights on that. Finally, pedestrian routes. I know I'm a little bit over folks, so bear with me. I'm just, uh, I've only been here with Zion National Park for about five years now, but it's just become a big part of my life and I love talking about it. I could talk about it all night long. I know you don't have all night, so I'm going to try to wrap it up here and, uh, and, and allow for some qu uh, questions and answers on your part. I want to show you this graphic, kind of tie us back into and really drive home uh, that concern we had at the beginning about uh, pedestrian entrance when we talk about pedestrian routes here in a moment, as soon as this graphic pops up. Okay, so you, you see that there's, there can be confusion in navigation. Uh, you see some, a group of people over here trying to figure out where do I go? Uh, after I get through this line, can I even get into this line? How long is this line? These people back here on the other side of the trees are wondering. Um, and am I in the right line? Um, should we walk up past it and see where we need to go and then get stopped and then turn around? And so there's just uh, quite a few issues just in this area, just to draw, drive home that point of congestion in the park and people congestion, cyclists, vehicles, all interacting, people needing direction and way, uh, wayfinding, better wayfinding uh, in this solution set we're proposing. Um, and decreasing that multimodal uh, interaction. It's a great example of what we were talking about earlier, having to cross over the double yellow line. This graphic here, again, this is an artist rendition. This isn't the intention of, uh, or, or what will be the, the, that new bridge with the pedestrian crossing that's parallel to it. Um, that's in the foreground. <clears throat> but what we're trying to show here is 
the need to get traffic um, if it's not like these folks here, this is intended to show you that they're crossing over the bridge on the pedestrian bridge crossing portion, which is physically separated from the road portion. Uh, the same with this, these two folks on this side of the bridge. This is intended to show the need for height of at least 12 feet between the, the paved pathway under the bridge and the bottom most part of the bridge structure to accommodate cyclists as well as pedestrians. Um, there we go. So you see a broad overview of what we've discussed at length, I might uh, joke about myself there. Um, and now I think we are ready to transition back to Jonathan. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Carter, for that presentation. We appreciate your taking the time to share a little bit about what folks might be able to expect going forward. But before we move forward with design or begin construction on any of the improvements that you addressed, uh, it's important for us in the National Park Service to have all of your feedback, everyone who's watching this presentation. We are going to be addressing the questions that you asked in the chat in just a minute, but we'd appreciate your sharing formal comments after the presentation as well. You can share those formal comments using the National Park Service's Park Environmental and Public Comment website. And I know that link has been shared a couple of times in the chat, and I'm sure we'll share it again. When you're on that site, you'll also find this evening's presentation so that you can review the options that we've talked about. As far as things go tonight, the questions we've received cover a pretty broad range of issues. And in the interest of addressing as many of them as possible in a timely way, we're going to group them and address them thematically. Some of the themes that we'll be talking about tonight involve the way that these improvements would affect bicyclists, overall park capacity, and traffic patterns in the southern part of the park. So let's go through a few of these questions and we'll see if we can get you some answers. A couple of questions that have to do with um, access for bicyclists. A comment on the three entrance concepts, all of them force bicycle users across the river, even though the majority of bicycle riders want to ride up the main canyon to the Temple of Sinawaba. Please don't lump bicycle users into the pedestrian flow in the new concept for the entrance station. And another question, could you please tell us what improvements are designed specifically for bicycle users? I reviewed the Pepsi in detail and there was no mention of dedicated bicycle improvements. So, Bri, would you be able to address a little bit about how we've taken cyclist access into account in our planning process? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, as you can see in this, um, as you can see in this graphic that uh, we're sharing with you, we're back to the the south entrance area and the the three design concepts. So this question is great. Uh, what it what it indicates to us is uh, possibly the need for us to take a look at perhaps some type of specific dedicated cyclist entrance point in the south campground or in the south entrance area. So uh, I would encourage you to uh, please provide that uh, information uh, as Jonathan had indicated via Pepsi, uh, that question in particular, so that we can be sure to uh, to when we get to the design phase to try to address that issue. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, perspective that we often overlook, we folks who don't cycle, um, including myself. Um, so we will definitely take a look at that and see if there's a way that we can improve the flow of cyclists into the park. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bri, for addressing that. 
a couple of other questions that have to do with improvements in the southern part of the park. The story map section on pedestrian entrance improvements says construct a new oversized vehicle visitor drop off area. Where is this located? Please describe the purpose of this drop off area. And another question that's similar. For each of the three transit center concepts, can you please share, illustrate on the park planning webpage, how Springdale route shuttle buses circulate in each of these concepts? So I guess to sum that up, Bri, can you talk a little bit more about the concepts that we're looking at um, at the southern part of the park near the current entrance station? So the, the language that you're that the the questions are referring to are rooted and connected with that one that third option I believe it was we spoke about that larger option where we might accommodate tour buses coming into the park and dropping off uh, visitors um, and or uh, shuttle buses even or even just larger vehicles. Uh, uh, the uh, moderate sized tour buses. So that's one aspect of what we can provide in that one option. However, that does present some other conflicts for us. If we, if we um, move forward with that larger option in that south entrance area, to provide that, what it does is it forces uh, tour buses to come through the fee station area and then through that traffic circle and to and then dump into that larger um, new proposed area. So it, it we're trying to we're we're considering the balance between actually providing uh, an area that uh, is for larger vehicles to drop visitors off. But our desire would be to uh, achieve that outside of the park so that we don't have to include them in that traffic flow through the fee stations. I hope that answers your question and then highlights again for you uh, the need for us to consider uh, your input and please, please provide that input via Pepsi, thank you. Okay, thank you for addressing that, Bri. Um, we have a couple of questions here that have to do with uh, the way that this project could potentially change the way that folks access the park. And those questions are, will a dedicated lane for annual pass holders be added to the vehicle entrance station? It is very frustrating to have to wait behind uneducated visitors who ask questions at the fee station. Rocky Mountain National Park has a gate that is operable using the magnetic strip on the back of annual passes. It would be helpful for Zion to incorporate a pass holder only vehicle lane. And then the other question is, if all expansion opportunities are elected, I show three significant changes in traffic flow between the Springdale entrance and Watchman Campground. I would guess most of this effort would take place in the off season. As an annual visitor design in January and February, will there be expected closures of access to Watchman Campground or will construction be handled to provide consistent though degraded access during improvement construction? So I'd say that the overall question here is just for regular visitors, folks who come here on a regular basis or maybe multiple times a year, um, Bri, how would you expect that this project is going to affect them? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for those those questions. Um, they're spot on, and we learn from we learn from our own experiences, and hopefully from the experiences of others. In this case, other parks. And uh, I've been I've been a uh, recipient of the benefits of passing through the, a park entrance uh, because I'm an annual pass holder, and I can tell you I tell you what it, it's great to be able to just kind of bypass uh, all that traffic that's backed up. And it includes, uh, unfortunately, the folks that either didn't have the time or didn't, didn't think to think ahead to, to plan their, their visit to the park. And so they're, they're kind of discombobulated as they come into that entrance area 
uh, as they approach the monument area. So I know exactly what you're talking about. And um, we, uh, we will certainly explore here at Zion uh, the potential um, uh, integration of that kind of capability through our fee stations at a minimum We'll, we'll, uh, we'll game those scenarios out. We do have a, a, a traffic engineer and an analyst. Um, I don't know that it would take his, uh, much of his time and effort, uh, but we'll at least include him in the discussion um, and get his input on that. And as well, our, our IT specialists and other folks that are necessary for that, that type of discussion to, discussion to occur so that we can engineer that solution into um, uh, any given phase of this construction should it move forward. That kind of segues into uh, the other part of the question about timing of construction and continued access for visitors. And we're considering all of those um, elements associated with this thing called doing construction or constructing something in the park. And uh, it's probably lost on many people. Uh, we endeavor to make it as, uh, as transparent as, as possible so that uh, our construction efforts uh, do not impact our visitors or they minimally impact our visitors. In this particular scenario, what we covered is, is quite a broad um, construct of multiple different smaller projects uh, grouped together in an overall design concept plan. And that's done primarily so that we can uh, engage in uh, our regulatory compliance reviews as a whole package. Um, but that doesn't mean we have to construct everything all at once. And indeed, uh, we would most likely not do that because that would require uh, much more closures uh, and, and visitor interruption. So we're, we're trying to improve the visitor experience, but at the same time, we don't want to destroy the visitor experience while we're trying to improve it. So we will phase construction, whether or not the, this is one large project or constructed under a multiple um, different contracts. Uh, that's yet to be determined because, again, we're still in design uh, and review phase. But we will uh, we'll also need to phase our construction in a manner that addresses some of those compliance concerns. For example, we do need to remove some trees uh, in the South Campground area. There are particular requirements for us to do anything with our trees in or around, you know, on or around our trees. And so we need to time that activity as well in particular seasons and uh, in, in conjunction, well integrated with the phases of construction. Pretty obvious that in, in the South Campground, we would ne be needing to do groundworks, site preparations and improvement uh, as one of the first actions. And there is some concern that um, uh, our uh, removal of our trees also needs to be sequenced and phased so that we're not impacting the, uh, the natural resources uh, too significantly at a singular time. So we are considering all of those facets as well as the question addressed access, uh, continued access to the Watchman Campground. We will, we will also get contractor input. So this the ideas that we have that we're putting forth to you, your ideas that you're giving back to us, um, continues through design and indeed even into, into the contracting and construction um, phase of this type of work where we get input from the contractors. So, you know, we're, we, we have an idea of how we would uh, propose that the contractor um, shape time, phase their construction activities and their locations of the construction activities and staging. But we also want their input uh, so that we can evaluate that because they may have great ideas too that add even less impact to our visitors. So thank you for that question. All right, thank you for addressing that, Brian. We have reached our time limit. 
there were a couple of other questions that were asked that had to do with our visitor use management planning process and overall visitor capacity. And I can address those very briefly to say that we are working on an update to our visitor use management plan that we plan on sharing a little bit later this year. So look for more information about that to come out in the months ahead. Um, we very much appreciate that everyone was able to join us this evening. And we hope that you'll be able to take everything that you learned from this presentation and share some informed comments with us on our park planning website. We're going to be taking all of those under advisement as we move ahead with the planning process, design process, and perhaps eventually construction. We are very glad that we were able to share this information with you. We're very glad that you were able to make time to hear from us. And that concludes our meeting. So thank you all for making time to be here tonight.